Number four, this one. Have we not seen this? Yeah, Mike's. And oh my. When team killers realize they've been caught. Oh, we have not seen this one. The bag picking teeth from his skull, like playing with his tongue. He's all sick and everything. <laughs> he kept on punching him and, and shooting him, and I had to grab him like this to pull him back, and I told him to stop. You give me people are gonna hate us for this. I hate my life. This is our life now. Oh my god, man. 15 year old Seth what Jackson happened? was a typical teen boy living in Summerfield, Florida with his parents, Scott and Sonia Jackson, and his <sighs> two older brothers. He loved animals and had aspirations to join the Ultimate Fighting Championships. His parents had agreed to enroll him in training courses when he turned. I did not see this one because I, it wasn't liked. I just liked this video. There are many titles that are exactly the same. There, this channel has titles that... Look, right here. When a teen killer realizes she's been caught. When teen killers realize they've been caught. I don't think I've seen this exact video. Maybe you've seen it. This was on JCS. Well, I don't remember it and I'm watching it now. Turned 18. Little did he know that when he began a relationship with 15-year-old Amber Wright, it would lead down a dark and twisted path that would ultimately end those aspirations, what along with his life, in an unimaginably horrifying fashion. As is often the case, their relationship was happy, in the beginning at least. However, after a year, things turned sour between them. During these difficult times, Amber added fuel to the fire when she began a close relationship with 18-year-old Mike Bargo. I did not Seth's watch this. Seth's best friend, Will Samalot, claimed that Seth was traumatized when the end of their relationship finally came, amid speculation that Amber was actually cheating on him with Mike. On Sunday, April 17, 2011, Seth and Will went to visit a mutual friend. That night, when they left to walk home, Will noticed that Seth was texting on his phone and seemed distracted. Shortly after 9 p.m., the two parted ways. That was the last time Will would ever see his friend. Seth's mother, Sonia Jackson, filed a missing persons report the next day when he didn't return home. When a news report concerning Seth's disappearance appeared on TV, Amber Wright's half-brother, Kyle Hooper, had an emotional breakdown, telling his mother that he had knowledge of what happened to the missing teen. The story that Kyle told his mother was appalling, and she contacted the authorities. Someone, show me a clip. What VOD? Send me the link to the VOD. Where did I watch this? She did watch it before. I was watching this live the other day, but she can watch it again if she wants. Where? What VOD? Someone show me. I'm, I'm baffled. I'm actually baffled. Anybody. I, I'm so confused why so many people are so con like confident that I've seen this before. It's tripping me out. It's making me feel like have I? <gasps> Wait, where is it? Show, oh, where's the VOD? Different teens. I'm pretty sure you guys think that this is the same video as a different one because it has the same title. I don't, I don't remember this at all. I don't think I've seen this. Yes, gaslight me indicating that a ramshackle house in Summerfield, Florida, held the key to Seth's mysterious disappearance. When investigators visited this location and rounded up the suspects in Seth's disappearance, they soon learned that the full truth was far more grisly than they ever could have conceived. According to Kyle's testimony, Justin Roach Soto, Amber Wright, homeowner Charlie Ely, Mike Bargo, and he himself... There is no way! I have never seen... They have never seen five people listed out like this before with their ages underneath. There is no way. Right. Someone tell me. Yeah, Ray, you're right. Right. We've never seen this. Right. Yes, you have. Prove it. I'm, I, I actually, I, I have to know. I just have to know. Let's see here. When teen killers realize they've been caught. Uh, let's see. When the killer thinks the cameras are off. When teen killers realize they've been caught. This is the one we're watching right now. When a teen killer realizes he's been caught. 
when a teen killer realized they've been caught. Shocking moments, killer realizes he's been caught. When a teen killer realizes she's been caught. Wow. Is there more? I see why it seems like if you name the YouTube video like that, they do really well because those are the those are the most watched videos. I'm losing my mind. We're present on the scene the night Seth went missing. Investigators collected these individuals and brought them down to the station for interviews, with the exception of Mike Bargo, who they were unable to locate at the time. When dealing with multiple suspects, such as in this case, one common tactic the detectives will use is to separate them, allowing each one of them to tell their version of events independently. Once an inconsistency is found, detectives will present this inconsistency to all of the suspects in the hopes that all of them will tell the truth. This technique would prove critical as detectives began to unravel the complicated skein of threads in a complex tapestry of murder, unveiling one of the most twisted and chilling motives we've ever seen in a case. What follows is never-before-seen interrogation footage exclusively obtained by Ewu. You can sit right there. That's fine. Thank you. That's kind of why we have the chairs to sit up. All right, so what's the issue? This is 20-year-old Justin Soto. To his friends, he's known by the nickname Roach. He's the eldest of the suspects, and investigators believe that he may have intimate knowledge of what happened to Seth, as he is a current resident in the house. What's the issue? You know what? I have a feeling you're going to tell me, okay? Listen, I want you to understand something, mm -hmm. okay? I don't know what you do or don't know. You're not in trouble with me, yeah. okay? But this is extremely important. The detective tries to reassure Justin that he's not in trouble, but this might not be the entire truth. Police will often say things like this to gain rapport with suspects so that they'll be more forthcoming with the officers. Um, are you from around here? Like, like I've, lived, I've lived here for a while, but I'm from Hawaii. You're from Hawaii? Yeah. Where, where here have you lived? I mean, how long have you been living here? Um, since I was about 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. A few years. Oh, so you've been here a while? Yeah, I've been here okay. a while. Investigations usually begin with discussions of general information like this, so the detective can get to know the suspect and begin to make them feel comfortable with the interrogators. Let's talk about your tattoos a little bit. Do you mind? Yeah, I'm on okay. Okay. What's it say on the front? Here. This this says head buster on it. Well, how, what is that? H. Head buster. You, you want to tell me that I wouldn't remember a guy having cursive tattoo that says head buster on his... This. I know for a fact I've never seen this video. I will give a hundred dollars to someone that could prove otherwise. There is no way. You guys are wrong. Wrong. S A O. I'm still on it. -E it's true. People generally like to talk about their tattoos and the meanings behind them. Wrong. So it's an easy question to get the conversation flowing. Head if bust Justin on my feels ass, at ease bruh. with the detective, he may be more willing to give her information regarding what happened to Seth. Justin shows the detective his tattoos and she jokes around with him, building an atmosphere of trust and camaraderie before getting around to the impending serious discussion. Suddenly, the detective notices something interesting. Yeah, this is my last one. I have a mushroom right here. Oh, that's a new one, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that I wouldn't remember seeing this shit. Yeah. Mushroom dick looking ass my ass, bruh. What are all the scratches about? Right, I mean, right. Some, I was walking through the woods and some vines got a hold of mm -hmm. it. And like three or four vines wrapped around my leg and I went to go walk in it. it that's crazy. Any others? No, that's it. That's it? Okay. You don't have anything in your back and your arms? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's different. Usually that's where they put them all. <laughs> okay, I'm done pausing. Cold or something? Yeah, I've been sick for like almost two weeks now. Well, I'm not really sick anymore. I just got this crazy behind cough and it aggravates me. While Justin's explanation may be true, a sudden increase in coughing can also indicate an increased stress level. As the body goes into fight or flight mode, mucous membranes dry up, which can make the mouth and throat feel dry. Ooh. For someone who already had a lingering cough, this dryness could cause further irritation and make the coughing increase. 
Um, I understand. Oh you guys no, are not another in, coffer. In a crowd. I, you know, I'm older, so I'm going to say kids. Yeah. Um, hanging out together. Okay. I hear, I hear that. You know, tempers, <coughs> tempers flew. Okay. And things happen. <coughs> okay. Where are you going from? <coughs> What's today? Tuesday. Today is Tuesday. <coughs> Justin succumbs to a coughing fit here just as the interview begins in earnest. Do you know why you're here? You know, Not really did know. anybody explain? Tell me, tell me how you ended up here. I'm such an empath. I woke bro. up this morning to Charlie waking me up, and there was all when he right coughs, there, I need to cough. I'm here now. <coughs> Each of yeah, those I'm being I'm interrogated I'm lived with Charlie Ely in her home at the time of Seth's disappearance, except for Amber Wright, who visited regularly and frequently stayed overnight. Okay, so you just got in a car and you didn't ask any questions like, what do you want? Why am I here? Nothing? You didn't ask anything? Oh, come on. I'm not worried about it. I didn't do nothing wrong. I mean, exactly. I was just coming over here to see what the hell's going on. Because I, I woke yeah, but, up. Yeah, but man. you even said it yourself, okay? You're nervous about places like this, okay? So there's no way you're going to sit there and tell me that you got into a police car, okay? And ask no questions as to why you're getting into a police car after being woken after up. After this... Okay? After this, I'll start Ace Attorney. Based on information she's already collected from Justin to point out that he may already be acting dishonest with her. So let's, let's, let's... They said an incident happened. Okay. With who? Um, I guess... Freaking something about some kid that I don't even know who the hell he is. And yeah, you do. Who is he? <gasps> his name's Seth or some, something like that. And supposedly, I guess he... Tell got shot him. Or whatever. Okay. That's all I know. Like, like the girls, I guess they went to go meet up with him or something. And what girls? This is a Charlie warm up for Ace Attorney. Other one. This is 18 year old Charlie Ely. She's the owner of the house where Justin, Kyle Hooper, and Mike Margo also live. I lay. I'm about to go crazy. Oh, this girl's guilty. Charlie has been obsessively checking and examining her body since entering the interview room. This may be indicative of anxiety. After nearly 20 minutes, a detective finally arrives to speak to Charlie. Hello? Hello. How are you? Good. About Good. to go crazy. About to go crazy? Yeah, I can't. I'm Okay. Well, we don't need that. I'm the sheriff's office. Charlie. Charlie? What's your last name, Charlie? Ely. Ely? Ely. E-L-Y. Okay. How are you doing? <coughs> How old are you? 18 years old. Okay, do you, do you know why you're here? Yes, sir. Why are you here? Because um, something happened with Seth. Something happened with Seth? Yeah. Okay. All right, understand that we had a deputy bring you down here because of what may have happened yeah. with Seth, okay? okay? There's an investigation that we're going to investigate. Are you clear with that? Charlie sighs heavily. This which girl's may be so an example guilty. of her using an adapter to expel nervous energy. Adapters are nonverbal ways that people comfort themselves when they're feeling stressed. I'm going to sit back and uh, pretty much just give you the floor. You're, you've already explained to me about, why you think, why are you here? Okay. I know why I'm here. Explain to me why you're here. Why are you here, Often Charlie? detectives will allow the suspect to simply tell the story in their own words. This allows them to observe and catch any lies and inconsistencies pointing these details out to encourage the subject to tell the complete truth. And be honest with me. Totally truthful. Hold your head up. Okay, Sunday night. What is it? Yeah, Sunday night, Amber and I walked up because her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, was Seth, and he, they wanted to work for out. So we met him up. Um, is it Sunday night? Yes, sir. At 58th Court, it was approximately 9.30. So you met him on the corner? Yeah. Okay. They talked. For, what corner did you guys meet him on? I think it's 58th Court. I want to say that's what it is. And who all met there? Me, Amber, and Seth. Amber is, of course, 15 year old Amber Wright, Seth's ex girlfriend, the half sister of Kyle Huber, and suspected love interest of Mike Bargo. Monka. In another room not far away, she will soon begin a similar story. Okay. I introduced myself before. My name's Rhonda, okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about this, okay? Okay, I just need you to tell me the story. And let's start with the other night. I understand that you and Charlie 
went to another neighborhood or went down the street. Tell me how this all comes about. Unlike the other detectives, Detective Stroop goes straight into the story, beginning with Amber's role in the events. Well, me and him were already talking on the phone. Me and him? Seth. Okay, you and Seth. Did Seth call you or did you call Seth? Seth. Well, Seth. he had called me a couple days before that. Thank you, Patty. Okay. I called him that night. And you and Seth, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? You two had had a relationship. Was he, uh, how, how was your relationship with him? Not the best. Tell me why you say not the best. We'd always fight. He'd always hit me. <gasps> and hit on me and all that. So he was physically abusive to you? Yes, okay. When Amber describes her relationship with Seth, she touches her hair. Another adapter behavior. She may be feeling uncomfortable as she talks about this sensitive subject. I mean, Who yeah. Me, Charlie, my brother. Okay, so Kyle knew about it. It's not was easy it, to there talk a lot about. In the neighborhood just that ran around with you guys that knew this. Yeah. Because your mom, I understand, knew it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Seth had called you a few days before. Mm -hmm. You called him back, and what day was that? Um, I think it was Sunday night. Sunday night. It was the night that this all happened. Okay, so you called Seth, and what did Seth say? Well, it started off. I was like, "Hey, I know you called me the other day, and I didn't answer, but you wanted to make up. So do you want to make up or like try and be friends or something? Because I'm sorry for everything." And he was like, "Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea for the both of us because we're both tired of fighting with each other, but we just wanted to stop the drama." Okay. So were you guys gonna get back together as a couple? No, we were just going to try and be friends. Okay. Because we were friends before we were dating. Okay. We were really close. Okay. And he was like, well, you should walk down here. And I was like, well, if I walk down there, I'm not walking alone because it's too dark, so can my friend Charlie come? Uh -huh. And he was like, sure, I guess. Where was Seth at when he said walk down here? Um, The neighborhood at the end of my road, Bellevue, Bellevue Ridge, Ridge Estates. Okay, so Seth was at Bellevue Ridge. Whose house was he at down there? He said something about Brittany. It seems likely Brittany was the friend that Seth and Will were visiting the night of his disappearance. Will mentioned that Seth had been distracted, texting on his phone once they left. Police later recovered these messages. They read, Hey, can you talk? You said you needed to talk. Well, I kind of need to talk to you about us working things out. What do you mean? Can you please call me, like now? Yeah, sure. Hey, my friend Charlie is coming with. I've been telling her everything between me and you, and she's coming because I need her to help through this. Is that okay? But don't tell anyone what's going on because I want to make sure we can work things out before anyone knows. Amber, if you have me jumped, I will never give you the time of day. So if I get jumped, say goodbye, all right? I swear you're not, Seth. I could never do that to you. I just want me and you back. Okay. I'm walking up the hill now. I'm at the neighborhood road. Where are you? Sorry, I didn't want Will to hear me, but stay around the corner where me and you fought. Just wait right there, and I'll be there in a minute. This was Seth's very last text message. It's what? interesting that he was suspicious of Amber's motives here, as he fears that she's planning to have him jumped. Perhaps he had a good reason to be wary. Oh, so guys, he knew. Talk. We were talking for maybe like not even 30 minutes. Okay. And his mom, I guess, texted him. And I was like, who are you texting? I thought we were talking. And he was like, my mom told me either right now or never. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess they started arguing whatever. And then he looked at me. He's like. He arguing with his mom through yes. text? Okay. And I guess he called her a bitch or whatever. I didn't want to get in it. And then he was like, look, I'm not in the mood to talk right now. I'm getting out of here for now. I'll see you around. And he. He just stormed off, so when he stormed off, we went back to my house. And about an hour later, he came to my house. Mike was off in his room like he always is. Okay. He never comes out. So he had no idea you went to see Seth or that you came back from seeing Seth that you're aware of? I didn't tell him. Okay. And Kyle's in the living room. What's Kyle doing? Kyle just sits there and watches TV like he always is. Okay, he so he's just watching TV in the living room. Mike's in the bedroom. Okay, and then what happens? Seth comes Seth to the house? knocked on the door and Charlie answered it. And she was like, well, what do you want? And he was like, I just need to talk to Amber. Can I come in? I, I don't know what it is you're being careful about, okay? And I, it's okay to be careful, okay? But the truth is what it is, okay? And that's what I need. It is you. what it is. That's pretty much what it is. I don't, I don't know the kid. Okay. I know he's a little white boy. And Using the phrase pretty much is what is known as an exclusion qualifier. Other examples of exclusion qualifiers could be saying something like not really or for the most part. It allows the person to tell some of the truth while hiding the rest. It's important to note that just because you hear someone use one of these statements, it's not proof that they are lying, but an indication <laughs> that they may be. Him and one of the girls used to date or whatever. And Which girl? The Amber girl. Well, you just told me more than you told me a few minutes ago. How do you know Amber? As a friend. How did you meet her? Through her brother, Kyle, the other dude okay. on the team. Okay. All right. So is Kyle the other one that lives with you? Yeah. Okay. Well, then now I know you know more than you're saying because, you know. He just moved in, too. I know, but Kyle likes to talk, doesn't he? The detectives have pinpointed Kyle as the potential weakest link. 
After all, he is the one who originally confessed information to his mother, which resulted in the four being here at the station. Ooh. What is unclear at this point is exactly how much Kyle has told his mother and the investigators. We can't be sure what the detective already knows, but neither can Justin. I haven't chilled with the kid in like... You what? I haven't chilled with or hung out with him in a little while until he moved in and started living there. Well, now you're making me think things a little differently, okay? The detective scoots her chair closer to Justin. This increased physical proximity creates additional pressure for him to tell the truth. Get him! You're making me think that maybe you had some involvement in all of this. Did you? No, ma'am. Did you have any involvement in any of this? No, ma'am. No? Where'd you get the scratches from on your legs? Vines walking through the woods. Because they were very, very fresh scratches. Mm -hmm. When did you get those? Yesterday. I was walking through the woods yesterday. Yesterday? Mm hmm What woods were you walking through? In my old neighborhood, where I was going to talk to the dude about the tree job. Okay. What neighborhood is that? It's, it doesn't have a name. It's behind a church, a big church. This is an unsatisfactory answer, and mm -hmm. the beginning of a series of very vague answers from Justin. I work in the woods, too, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't get scratched up like that. No, they have, like, little, what are those called? Thorns or whatever mm -hmm. on them. Okay. They're up there on my leg. Let and... me see your other leg. Yeah, you're pretty scratched up. Mm -hmm. That's not from a walk through the woods. Sure it is. No. no. Talk to me, Justin. That's what, that's what happened. That's woods. Oh, I believe it's woods. Yeah. I believe that. I have no doubt it could be that. But that's not from walking through the woods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You were either running, you were walking in the dark. The detective returns to the night in question, and Justin continues his strategy of distancing himself from the others. I don't know anything about what happened. Like, I just came home and I went to sleep. While Justin maintains his ignorance of the situation, the girls continue their version of events. Did Seth call you before he came back? No, ma'am. So he just showed up an hour later? Yeah. When you came back, did you talk to your brother or Michael about what Seth had said or that you guys had had a conversation? Did they know? No, they didn't know what we talked about. Okay. Uh, Kyle asked me where I was going, and I just went, I was like, I'm going to talk to Seth and try and figure things out. Notably, there's no mention of Justin being present at the scene and Amber's version either. I hear a knock at the door. It's Seth. So I let him in, not thinking anything was wrong with it. Okay. <laughs> can, can you draw me a drawing of your, your house? <laughs> I guess. I, I, I just want to try to get a, a, a picture of what okay, exactly. Like the detective may be having Charlie draw the floor plan to make sure her story is crystal clear. However, a methodically laid out floor plan could allow the detective to point out certain details that seem implausible or odd as well. She let him in, he sits in the chair. Me and her are sitting by each other on the couch, and out of nowhere, Kyle just gets up and hits him. He so were they like, arguing first before mm -hmm. you get him? You just... No, nope. Amber and mm -hmm. Seth were talking, and Kyle comes out of nowhere and hits him, and me and Amber dart to my room. And, where was and he Kyle at? said, get the fuck out. And he went out that way, and we heard Mike's door hit something, and Mike came out, and we heard gunshots. Okay. And by then, me and Charlie took off to our okay. room. We shut the bathroom door, and we heard another door just fly open, and we just heard gunshot after gunshot after gunshot. And after maybe, like, five or six times of hearing it, it got quiet. And then you hear Kyle go, what did you just do? <gasps> the introduction of a gun into this scenario does not seem to bode well for Seth. Yet it's still unclear exactly what happened to him, as the girls were not visual witnesses to the event itself. It's difficult to piece together Seth's fate, especially since there hasn't been a body recovered. What? How do you think Michael knew Seth was out there? He probably heard him talking. Okay, so it's it's one of them things where it's not that far apart. They don't know where he is? He would, he would know Seth's small. voice? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. If we said anything to anyone, he would f***ing kill us. So this is after the gunshots. Yeah. He came back into the house. Yeah, with the gun. And he was hand. waving it around. What him. kind of gun was it? It was a revolver. Okay. I mean, he's like, it's like touching shit, so our fingerprints are on it. It's interesting that Charlie is choosing to volunteer information about Mike letting them touch the revolver at this point. It could very well be that she has a guilty conscience and is trying to preemptively dismiss certain pieces of evidence that indicate her guilt, such as her fingerprints being on a weapon. The back door open and, like, I don't really know. Like, I just heard a bunch of shit. Like, like he was Moving doing stuff something. around? Yeah. Okay, you document that. <coughs> now, did you hear any voices or anything? That you no, told it's coughing. It was okay, and what did you hear Mike saying? This is what you f***ing get. So when did you guys finally come out of the room? The next morning. Was anything different? Oh, it's, it just smelled like pure bleach in the house. That's okay. it. Do you know where the bleach came from? No. I had a bottle of bleach on the counter, but that's not there. So you had bleach and it's gone yeah. now? Mm -hmm. And Mike came into the room and he said, 
I swear if you guys open your mouth about anything about last night, I'm gonna come after you guys. He said, I gotta go. I'm going somewhere. Okay, he left? Yeah. He oh. said, I'm going somewhere. I'll be back later. And me and Amber went up to my friend Chris's house for... Did you look around your house or anything to see what... what like, I, mean, I was had to be curious around. about something, right? I was looking around, but I didn't see anything. Like, I didn't see really anything. I mean, my... The only thing I really noticed was in my bathroom, my shower doors, not my bathroom, but the guest bathroom, shower doors were down. Where was Michael the next day when you got up? Mm -hmm. Did you you see him? No, he just went and come out of his room and then me and Charlie left. And we were up at her friend's house until maybe four. What time did you call me? Um, So Michael was in the house though when you woke up in the morning? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is a minor discrepancy in what has been a very parallel story, since Charlie claims Mike was out and about making more threats, while Amber says he was asleep in his room until they left. This guy, Justin Soto, was he there when this happened? I didn't see him anywhere. Like, I don't think he was there. I think he was talking about going and talking to someone in another neighborhood about a job that he has to do, like, next week. What have you heard about Seth? I mean, everything you've heard to, about Seth. Like, he used to date Amber, and I guess, I don't know, it's pretty much it. I guess he had some problems with some other kid, and... What kind of problems? Once again, Justin uses two selective memory statements, I guess, and I don't know, followed by another exclusion qualifier. That's pretty much it. This doesn't mean he's guilty, but it could suggest that he's withholding information related to the case. It's mm-hmm. possible that he's either protecting someone else or himself by holding back. This is also only an indication of deception when it isn't part of someone's normal speech patterns. Some teenagers and young adults use phrases like pretty much all the time. This is another instance that highlights the importance of the officers having some low-stakes conversations with individuals before the interrogation begins so that they can get a feel for their baseline speech patterns. Oh, what's that he way, hiding? If their word mm-hmm. usage changes in association with certain topics, the he officer hiding. can be more certain that something is off about that specific topic. Like they were just like talking always to each other and who? Um I don't even know. Like yeah, who? Well I think his I think his name is Mike actually. I knew you would remember. I had faith in him. When did you it first meet like, Mike? Oh, I met him like two years ago. He met Mike nearly two years ago, but just a few minutes ago was acting like he didn't even know his name. She makes one last ditch effort to get him to open up to her. I'm sure Mike's gonna talk for what's best for Mike. So Justin needs to tell me what's going on and think about what's best for Justin. Yeah. I left yesterday, that's pretty much what happened. Did you leave with Mike? No. Did you leave with anybody else? All right, well listen, give me a few minutes and I'll be right back, okay? All All right. She leaves to acquire a smoke for him and likely to get an update on what the other investigators have learned from their suspects. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, bud. Do you mind if I talk to her again? Okay, I'm going to bring um, Kyle in here with you, okay? Okay. That's a squeaky, squeaky chair. This is 16-year-old Kyle Hooper, Amber Wright's half-brother. He's just finished a grueling one-on-one interview with a detective and is clearly distressed. Both your kids are in a thing for murder. Number two? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, we told you it wasn't a storm. I mean, it was, like, everything was planned. Approach everybody? Everybody. Admitting oh, that everything was wow. planned is extremely important because it proves Auntie. men's rea premeditated criminal intent. So not only has Kyle essentially admitted to murder on videotape, yep. he's also admitted to a specific degree of murder. Yep. First degree murder. There it is, just we're, like that. We're gone. They took my phone. <laughs> Everything's gone. James is on it too. On what? Is it on this? Now Kyle has also unexpectedly implicated his stepfather, James Havens the third, stating that he is in on it too. Kyle Hooper, much like his sister, has told detectives a bit of a story while his mother was present. However, they likely realize at this point that he is the weakest link, as he was the one who originally confessed to his mother. 
He certainly doesn't seem to want to tell the full story in front of her, so the detective pulls him out into a room alone, where he sits wiping ink from his hands from his fingerprinting. Little does he know, a confrontation is about to begin. So, sorry about that. Nothing's wrong. Um. Wow. I I, I want to be perfectly honest with you, okay? This is how this is how I work. I'm giving you an opportunity right now to lie to me, okay? Uh, if you take that opportunity, okay, you're a fool. No, I'm not lying to you at all. Everything that comes out of your little mouth right now better be 110% the truth, okay? All right, now let's start back at the beginning of this. And this is your one and only last chance to correct any discrepancies you may have. Oh my God. Chat, you guys are so annoying today. I don't care. Even if we saw it or not, I just don't care. I don't remember it. There's probably a lot of people here that haven't seen it either. It's like, constantly. Like, half the chat is like, haven't we seen this before? I don't know, I don't know what to, like, what do you want me to do? Just stop it right here and just watch something else? I, I literally do not remember this at all. I don't even know when I saw this. But all I know is that I did not like this video. I liked it right now, right when I started it. So that's how I know if I've seen something is if I've previously liked the video. This is the last time I'm pausing it. It's the last time I'm addressing it. If you don't want to watch it, then just go. Okay. You want to start fresh? No. Driving me crazy. <sighs> Man, I'm scared. Kyle, yeah. I'm sure you are. Okay? I, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to go through none of this. I didn't mean for none of this to happen. <laughs> okay, but you know what, Kyle? Right now is the time to man up. Right now is where the rubber meets the road. Okay? I can't do nothing for you. I can't, I can't even... I can do nothing. I can't talk to you if you're not going to tell me the truth. She may be trying to empathize with him to make him feel like she cares, but she makes no hints or promises that he won't be locked up or that she will help him. Meanwhile, Kyle is hiding his face with his hand, which may indicate that he feels shame and wants to hide himself from the detective's gaze. Shame, question mark? <laughs> so let's start, let's start at the beginning, okay? Just, just you and I here, just start at the beginning. What, tell me what really happened. Kyle begins his story with important insight into his state of mind that night. He and his biological dad did not get along, which may have been a major factor in Kyle's sudden decision to move in with Charlie. To that end, he sold his laptop to raise quick cash for rent, and that instigated an argument with his mother. Feeling like he was losing his family, he went to his stepfather, James Havens, for mental support, who later dropped him off at Charlie's house. His anger and frustration may have been contributing factors to his fateful decisions later that night. With the stage set, Kyle begins his shocking tale. He drops me off. Okay, here right, we go. Well, we got this kid that comes over. He plays, his name is Brandon. He plays a guitar. Brandon? Yeah, his name is Brandon. He plays a guitar. He's got long hair. He's in a band and stuff like that. That comes over to Charlie's house? Yeah. You know, he plays guitar. And, well, he was out there playing guitar and stuff like that out in the front yard and everything. And then um, Mike, he was, um, he was like getting all into it. He went in the house. I guess he was doing some pills or whatever. And, um, he was. What kind of pills? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, they were white pills. Oh, um, yeah. There's no telling where he gets any of this stuff. I don't know. He don't tell me nothing about stuff like that, honestly. Okay. The detective is interested in these pills, but all Kyle can contribute is that they were white. Yet Mike's alleged drug use white that night pills. may have contributed to him making the decision to kill Seth and follow through with that choice. Although it's unknown what specific drug he may have taken, many illegal substances have been linked to increased levels of violence. Um, uh oh. So he's snorting some pills and yeah, so on. And, and he's snorting he's pills. Tired, wired up, hyped up, and everything. And um, somebody brought up the name Seth, and um, he uh, he's like, "Man, I want to go with a killing spree tonight." He's like, I, "I just want to." And uh, he's like, "You guys down?" And I told him no. I told him, "I don't." He said, "You guys down." Who's he talking to? Like, like, you and him. Um, me, Amber, um, Charlie, um, Roach. Okay. Who's Roach now? Uh, oh, the guy Justin Soto. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Soto was Justin. <laughs> this guy okay. thinks he's not getting Kyle caught. Kyle hesitates, but then officially places Justin at the scene on this night. 
Disputing his claims that he did not hang out with them and had no knowledge of anything that took place. Justin is going to have some explaining to do. Mm -hmm. I know you were there. I know about what you did. I know that you participated. And I Wake want up. to know exactly what you did so that I don't blame you for something you didn't do. Because everybody else is. Ooh. All right? Blaming me? Yeah. The detective has clearly learned details from the other interrogations. However, Justin doesn't know how much she knows, mm -hmm. and she's implying they're laying the blame for events squarely at his feet. Mm -hmm. It appears that the detectives may be using the prisoner's dilemma as one of their tactics to get everyone to talk. A great tactic. This psychological dilemma involves separating people and then giving them a scenario in which each person must decide, without being able to communicate, if they're going to cooperate with each other and stay silent, or if they're going to turn on the other and deflect blame off of themselves. All the while, the detectives tell each person that the other has already spilled all of their secrets and blamed them. It's actually... That's such a difficult situation to be in. Like, say you're with your best friend, right? You think you know the guy, or whoever they are. You think you know them, but like, under pressure... Like, if you... Like, you want to be on the same page, but you don't know if they're trying to, like, save themselves from doing, like, 20 more years in prison. Like, how loyal do you stay to a story? That's tough. And then if you don't tell the truth and they do, you might get an extra 20 years. Everyone cracks? Yeah, I feel like... I feel like that it would be super, super, super rare to actually have someone that just completely sticks to their lies. The gamble. Here, each of the suspects face the same decision dilemma. If they all stay quiet, there may not be enough. I have an idea. How about don't don't put yourself in those situations? How about don't murder people? What about that? Then you won't have to deal with that. Evidence to convict them, or they could receive a lesser charge. But with the choice to cooperate with each other comes a great risk. If only one person stays silent while the rest talk. They risk getting blamed for everything. Mm -hmm. But if they all talk, then they all could face punishment. The detectives will put the pressure on even more by suggesting to each person that the others are pointing the finger at them. Is this just an excellent way for interrogators to get to the truth? Or is it unethical to pit suspects against each other as it could incentivize false confessions? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Yeah. Wow, well, I know what happened to Seth. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. So, the floor is yours. <sighs> Question is, is Roach going to look out for Roach? Or is Roach going to look, not look out I'm for him? I'm never going, going to prison, to man. I would get so bored. Well, since you put it that way, oh. this is what happens since they were <laughs> As easy as that. Justin joins Easy. Kyle in revealing the truth of that horrible night. Meanwhile, Kyle's grim story is far from over. Mike has just taken the pills and is amped up and ready for violence. What are you... Okay, yeah, bored in prison. What would you do? I, I think they give you books to read. I don't like reading. Okay, it took me a really long time to accept the fact I don't like reading books. I tried. Because it is a, it's supposed to be good for you. <laughs> I've tried reading books. I can't visualize what I'm reading very well. And so, you know what I mean? It's just really, it's difficult. It's not very pleasant. Like there's people that have like a wild imagination. And like when they read something, they can visualize it really well in their head. Yeah, can't relate. That must be nice. I have no idea what that's like. None. So like in prison, like what would you, what would you do? I'm just such a, a visual person. If there's no TV or video games or like anything, anything good to look at, I, I think I would lose my mind. What are you talking about killing people? He's talking about killing Seth. Uh, pretty much because he was like, man, I, I because he's like, um, all you gotta do is find him. There's TV. And everything like that. And he didn't want. Okay, Amber I to, will go to he prison. Didn't want Amber to call him off on the phone or text him. She didn't. He didn't want nothing to happen or talk. I'm okay with it. with it. 
What could Seth possibly have done to stir up such animosity with Mike? This couldn't have been a random event. There had to be a motive. Perhaps Amber has already given investigators a clue. Why does Michael not like Seth? Because he likes Amber. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he's kind of, have you ever dated Michael? We've never dated, but we've always, we've always had a thing for each other. Okay. But never dated. Okay. Despite what Amber says here, Seth certainly feels like she and Mike were in a relationship. The two former lovebirds engaged in a social media war after the breakup, which demonstrated how volatile things had become between them. In February I really miss of 2011, my baby, before the breakup, baby girl. their Facebook posts love you, were what Amber. one might expect from teens in love. But then on March Chilling 23rd, Amber announces that she is done, followed approximately a week later by a similar post from Seth, indicating that he is now single. Hit me Seth up. Seth and Amber continue to express their frustrations, which leads to an online war with friends on both sides providing support and sometimes a voice of reason when they take things too far. On April 3rd, Seth seems to want to extend the olive branch, but Mike gets involved and Amber makes it clear she wants nothing to do with Seth. According to some sources, it was around this time that Seth challenged Mike and the two got into a fight. Despite being younger by three years, Seth apparently won the fight, deepening the rivalry between them. Battle lines are drawn. Amidst this online chaos, it's no wonder that Seth was suspicious about being jumped when Amber suddenly wanted to make nice with him. Amber, if you have me jumped, I will never give you the time of day, so if I get jumped, say goodbye, I... ...them and get back together. Well, Amber decided, and she agreed to it. You really told jumped. everything. Jumped. So you can sit there and you can continue to lie on me, walk out and treat you like a piece of garbage, mm -hmm. or you can sit here and treat me with the respect that I treated you with. Okay, and you can tell me the truth. Oh my god. What's your choice gonna be? Oh, the truth. Okay, speak up so I can hear you too. Speak okay? up, Amber! Right. So let's start at the speak beginning up. again. Speak up! And you tell me this story. And the first time that I think you're lying, I'm getting up and walking out of here and I don't care what happens to you. Yes, ma'am. Do you understand me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The detective is far more aggressive now. Amber begins with Brandon playing music and designates the same players on the scene, including Justin and her stepfather. James and Brandon both left. After, like, Brandon was playing guitar and everything, they both left. And Mike was, like, talking to Charlie and Kyle and me. I work at a jail. You get TV, tablets, books, cars, board games? Usually watch you when I'm watching the inmates all day? Dude, I'm telling you. Prison is better than being on the streets sometimes. If I go to jail, it's going to be for self-defense or protecting someone I care for. And I want a tablet, please. I will pick up drawing. You he don't? Like, Definitely not. And I was like, for what? He but she said she works there! Like, for what, Mike? He's like, you do get food. 100%. Because I'm gonna kill him. And I was like, why do you think that? He's like, because I'm tired of him. This is a key moment, as Amber has now revealed her knowledge of Mike's intentions. This admission means that she knew something may happen to Seth if she called him to ask him to meet her. She's now gone from an innocent bystander to an instrumental part of Mike's plan. So I went into the front with Charlie, and I called him, yeah. and I told him I wanted to make up. With additional confirmation that the girls are not as innocent as they claimed, Guys, I'm not actually going to prison. That needs to take place to get and the And I also don't story. condone going to prison. I need you to be totally honest and truthful with me. Okay? It wasn't that deep, chill. Talk to other people, <laughs> talk to Kyle. Wasn't that deep? Okay. And Kyle has told us his new version of the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's from at this point he's been totally cooperative. Okay. okay, I know there's some things that transpired prior to. I know there was some conversations prior to about something happening. The detective is being intentionally vague when he hints that Kyle has given them information. He wants to increase Charlie's discomfort so she will be more likely to talk. I wasn't involved in that. I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, it might have been between him and Mike. But I don't know. Kyle has already, and I'll be honest with you, has implemented you in being involved in knowing or having knowledge to this thing transpiring prior to it happening. But I didn't. This this what doesn't make sense to me. You're telling me that you, you guys are in this house. You drew out a, a diagram for me yeah. of your house where everybody was sitting at. The C is for me. The A is for Amber. The K is for Kyle. The S is for Seth. And then Mike was in his room allegedly, correct? <coughs> okay. Who else was at this house that you did not put in there? Um, 
Roach was there, but he wasn't there when that happened. Yes, he was. I didn't see him. It seems likely that Kyle, Amber, and Charlie had previously coordinated with Justin to leave him out of the events completely. The detective shifts focus to Seth's arrival. And you said that he just un unannounced himself and just came to the house. Is that correct? Yeah. No one told him to come to the house? No. Right. How did he come to that house? Because I'm telling you right now, there's a different story in that other room. I mean, he walked. I mean, I understand. He probably walked with his toe, his left foot and his right foot, one in front of the other, and he physically came to the house. They are this sick is, of these kids. You need to be truthful with me. Sick of them. No lies you here. Because right now you're beating at the bush. Okay? And you're not being truthful with me. Can we both agree on that? Yeah. This at least is progress in the right direction. Let's check in with Kyle. <sighs> Take deep breath. You're doing really well. Kyle is going through it. It's about time. So, I mean, it's okay. Once he pulls himself together, he provides some insight into his feelings for Seth. I really hate Seth. And um, there was time because uh -oh. my ex girlfriend, I found him in the bed with my ex girlfriend, and I really didn't like that. And I loved her, but I really didn't want to go out and kill the kid, it, it wasn't my intention. Um, and he come, um, all right, mm -hmm. well, Mike was talking about it. He's like, listen, he's like, I'll do it. And Amber, and believe it or not, Amber wanted it done. Amber don't want nothing to do with him, Amber wanted him dead and gone. He deserved it. Kyle is deflecting responsibility off himself by justifying what they did, by blaming the victim and stating that he deserved it. Oh, my. I, that, I didn't want to do it, and I didn't want nothing to be a part of it. I didn't want nothing. But And Mike said he would do but it. But Mike said he would do it. So you and talked he, to and Mike he kept on saying, he kept on saying, man, I'll take the blame for it. I'll take the blame for everything. I'll do it. I'll do everything. I'll take the blame. If, if the cops ask you if anything, I'll take the blame. I have nothing to lose. Kyle has admitted to quite a bit so far. Yeah. He seems to mistakenly believe that Mike could take all the blame for killing Seth if he's the only one who pulls the trigger. It's whatever. And Amber agreed to it. Everybody was agreeing to it. So did Soto agree? Huh? Soto wrote. Yeah, everybody agreed. He like agreed. I said, everybody agreed. Amber agreed. Mm-hmm. And Jay. Charlie agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mike said he would that do it. That is scary. Agreed. So there's five people. Okay. Imagine five people agreeing to murder you. Clear that Kyle is stating that each of them were involved in premeditation for murder. That's horrific. Mike's like, man, I can't do this. It's got to be done now. He's like, wait, Mickey, he's not. He's sitting in the love seat. He, he's like, it's got to be done now. He, oh, Mike opened the door. I come out. I hit him over the stick with the head. Where was Seth when you hit him? He was in the chair. Okay. And I hit him over the head with the stick. And it broke three times on him. Kyle had previously oh. admitted that both he and Justin Soto intended to hit Seth to make it easier for Mike to kill him. This is considering aiding in the murder and could make them just as culpable as Mike. He's now admitted that he actually followed through on his part. In another room, Charlie's detective is about to use this event to perform a coup de grace. Uh, a no coup de grace. When Kyle hit Seth across the head with this stick board or whatever it, this object was, what the hell are you doing? What's going on if you didn't know what was going on? You see the picture I'm painting now? Obviously, you had to know what was going on, okay? Because any person in their right mind would have asked this question, if you and I are sitting in this room, and wh whoever's sitting over here and I just start beating the hell out of him, aren't you going to want, what's going on? Yeah. You never said that. You know why? You know why? Yeah. Why? Something might happen. Exactly. Charlie finally admits that she knew something might happen. Once the detective started being aggressive about her lies, it didn't take very long for her to break under the pressure. <laughs> I hit him and he stood up. And when I broke it over his head three times, he stood up. And then Roach come in um, and then he hit him with the st his stick. And he oh. was and then he was trying to go through the kitchen and uh, Mike shot him in the back twice with the gun. Oh, God. God. So I put the thing and I flew against the counter and I looked. Roach hit him with a stick too? Yeah. I didn't look at it. I was in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And all I seen was Seth fly, and then Kyle and Roach flew, and Mike flew right behind him. And Charlie was like, coming through, coming through, coming through. When Kyle hit him over the head, that's when we ran into the room because we didn't know where Mike was. Like, we thought he was in his room, and obviously that's where he was, but like, we didn't know where he was with the gun. Okay. Um, and then he was still trying to go out. The, he was still trying to go out the front door, and Mike just kept on shooting him. I kept on telling Mike, I was like, "Stop it! Stop it! Let him go! Let him go!" Mike, and he just kept on shooting him. And he goes out. He goes out the. He goes out the house. I just got out of the way and 
like put the and Rose grabs him like this and set on the ground and has him choked and uh, I don't know what he did to his knee but he kind of messed up his knee and he rolled Roach rolled over who messed up his knee Roach okay. Soto and he rolled over and might come up and shot him in the head and that's when it was over oh. Mike shoots him how many times Five times, maybe, I guess. Right there on the spot? And, God, man. And, um, uh, come back into it. And then, um, uh, I was like, Mike's like, man, grab him, grab him. You gotta grab him, Kyle. We can't have no way. You gotta grab him. And I, and I was scared. I was freaking out. And I'm like, I, okay, okay, okay. And I grabbed him. And I pulled him up the stairs. So stupid. And, and who? And it's Seth. And I started pulling him up the stairs. Was Seth still alive? Partially, yeah. He was what? still breathing at that time. He was partially still alive. I walked in the room with her. I was so shaken up. I'm staring at her. I'm crying. She's trying to hold me to stop crying. I'm about to puke from it all. And then they got him in the house and laid him on the floor. And then um, they put him in the bath. And then um, who Roach put him come in the bath? Roach come in and he helped put him in the bathtub. Like, oh. Did you help put Steph in the bathtub? Yeah, I like grabbed a little piece of him and like just put him in there. And then a like, piece of him. him? When he was in the bathtub. He just, Mike kept on getting all psycho and pissed. He kept on punching him and, and shooting him. And I had to grab him like this to pull him back. And I told him to stop. I said, listen, you need to stop right now. And then I come in and then Mike's wanting to break him. I come in and Mike's trying to break his kneecaps to, you know, to put Is him he dead at this time. point? Or is he yeah, still? he's completely dead. Oh, my. Who broke his neck, legs and knees? I think Mike did that. And that's when Mike had his kneecap, had his leg pulled out like this with, like, with some in his hand, some hard. Trying to break his knee. Why? Down. How'd you get the scratch marks on your legs? <sighs> um, Fighting with Seth? No, I didn't. That's some with still woods and stuff. Finding uh, firewood? Huh? Finding firewood? Yeah. To burn up Seth? I guess, yeah. And then Mike was like, Roach, get him in the bathroom. And then Charlie was like, Amber, don't walk out there. Don't walk out there. We don't need to see it. So Mike walked in the room with his gun in his hand, and he was like, I love you both, but if you say anything, I'll kill you both. When a person threatens to kill another person to get them to commit a crime, that creates a duress defense. However, this is not usually a defense to a homicide, as it's considered wrong to take another person's life, regardless of whether your own life has been threatened. Furthermore, since Amber was aware and participated in these events before there was ever a threat involved, her part in the murder is already done. Mm -hmm. 22. There's no 22. getting out of that, um, sweetheart. 22 revolver, it's all black. Where is it at right now? Um, Don messed up, sweetheart. It's under the house in the, in the, in the air duct. That's where the gun's at right now. That's where the gun where is supposed the to be at right now. That you guys uh, um, everything got burned. He then begins to explain how they disposed of Seth's body once his kneecaps were broken in the bathtub. And then he hot tied him, and then he put him in the bag. In what bag? Uh, the, the, like I said, that, um, the best sleeping bag. Oh. Okay, so after the bathtub, they put him in some blue thingy that you said, yeah, like a bag. a bag or something. Okay. He, what was, brought, they he was brought up there. Who brought him out? Mike and Toto. It says Mike and Soto. <laughs> well, they, they brought him out there first, and I just, like, dragged them a little bit after a pause justin amends his story since the detective already knows he was involved yeah but just a little bit he'd already been collecting wood for the fire and now they got it started in the backyard preparing to dispose of the body in the bag we had these two tires the tires now the rubber was supposed to i guess what mike said was supposed to uh do over overdo the smell of the dead the burnt body something like that mm -hmm. um so Where'd you get the oh. tires? The tires were already in the front yard. They they come off of uh, some car or something. They, and then I come out there, and then Roach was uh, telling me um, it, uh, something about the shovel. Like, uh, I guess he hit him over the head with a shovel or something, because he, he was still, like, Mike's psycho. He, he's crazy. He, he, the, the guy's completely dead. He's still hitting him. What? If what Kyle is saying is true, Mike continuing to strike the body with a shovel could suggest that he's trying to relive the experience of killing Seth. <laughs> He may have felt a rush of adrenaline when he first attacked the victim, and he wants to feel that excitement again. That's insane! The drugs insane. Mike took may have also contributed to his frenzied behavior. You and Mike stayed out there and watched the body burn in the fire, I right? stayed out there. You stayed much. out there by yourself? Yeah, most of the time. Okay, well, I, thank you. I appreciate your being honest about that, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so I guess it was your job to make sure the body burned? Mm -hmm. 
I just wanted it all to be over. The next morning, when the fire's out, Mike prepares what remains of Seth's body for disposal. Um, you know, we're just going around there. Uh, Mike's in the back, picking teeth from his skull, like playing with his tongue. He's all sick and everything. He and um, he's putting them into them paint, the containers with paint and everything, the ashes and everything. Who's helping him do that? Uh, he he was at that point. He was just doing everything by himself at that point because everybody just said, F it, "We're done." Where is Seth right now? Where where is all of his body parts? It's um. Somewhere in Ocala. Where? Oh, well, it's, it's some, some rock quarry thing or whatever. This quarry was a place Mike had once gone swimming with an ex-girlfriend, and he knew it was a desolate place, perfect for disposing of the paint buckets that contained his victim. It's out. You brush your teeth, right? Yeah. No toothpaste look like, right? No. Oh. You mashed it? Yeah. You, you can't, can't put, put the in toothpaste back in the toothpaste bottle. Once it's out, it's out. Can't go back in, can No. Somewhere nearby, Amber faces the music for her part in the debacle. What were you thinking? I was scared. What were you scared of? There was no, there was no threat was at the time. But, but there was no threat at the time. Seth wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. So what? I mean, what are you being afraid of? Seth wasn't even there. There was nothing for Mike. Mike, you said Mike told me, "I love you both." He would never do anything to hurt you. What were you thinking about getting Seth up there? I don't know. I wasn't thinking at the time. Did you just hate Seth that bad? I didn't hate him. I was hurt. Does your mom know about that? The detective asks her brother the same question. What do you think your mom's going to say when you... Does your mom know this true story? I don't know. She knows words. What do you think mom's going to say? Not one of her children, but both her children are involved That's in murder. That's insane. Last but not least, there's Justin. I don't, I just don't want to get into more shit. I didn't even want to get into this shit. I just wanted just to get my life together. Right. Yeah, this is a good way to do it. But, oh, it's fucking out of the picture now. Why, why didn't you just, picture. let me ask you this, you know, you're telling me you want to get your life straight, this, that, the other, I, I don't you know, like, that's all bullshit, I, because I, if I you want to get like... your life straight, you know what you would have done? You would have not participated in this, and you would have called the cops and said, this is what's about to happen to this kid. Mm -hmm. You gave no regard to another person's life. Mm-hmm. No why regard to another person's life. I don't call 911. You don't call 911? I don't like you. But you let a person die. <laughs> Because I don't call 911. I'm so hard. Stupid. Enjoy jail, all of you. With interrogations complete, detectives begin sending the suspects one at a time to where Kyle and his mom are waiting. He's sitting in the chair, currently just off screen. She said, you tell me the truth and all I can do, and straight the truth, and I will try helping you. That's why I need to talk to the detective again. I'm gonna just come out with it. I'm gonna get everything done and over with. And Poor I just mom. Want it done. So I feel so bad for the if mom. If someone cannot afford an attorney, they have a constitutional right to have an attorney appointed. This is explained to every person in custody as a part of their Miranda rights. But Kyle doesn't seem to fully comprehend this right. I wish I would never met this kid, man. Yeah. So, I wish you didn't meet Mike. <laughs> that too. I had to. They knew we were lying. Immediately, Amber confronts Kyle. Is that your mom's purse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They should leave it? Yeah. No. Actually. So, we've interviewed Amber, Charlie, and now. You can't now. You know you're lying to me. They immediately begin talking about the interrogation. It's likely that they're unaware that they're being recorded. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> He's not going to wait for me. Charlie taps her arm where her husband's name is tattooed. 
With the prospect of facing incarceration before them, the conversation turns to their feelings about the idea. In time, they begin to speculate Whoa. about the one person who is still missing. Justin. Oh, jeez. Think people want to be around that? Do you think people think there's those kind of people are supposed to be here? Yeah, but it's not our fault. Hell, I don't even like the kind of people, and I'm one of them now. I don't need and I didn't even do anything. Throughout their discussions, they've been placing the blame squarely on Mike as the ringleader, discounting their own contributions to Seth's murder, as Kyle does here. They seem to struggle to acknowledge what they've done or take responsibility for their own actions. Amber. Where are the clothes that you had on that Sunday? After Amber yeah. answers the detective's question, Kyle takes the opportunity to try to find out some information. Can you tell us anything what's going to happen to yep, us? Yep, I sure can. I will. Just in one second, just let me go back and tell him what she said. What shirt did you have on? This is the story. You're an adult, correct? Juvenile and juvenile, correct? Am I right? Mm -hmm. you're you two are under 18 and you're 18. You're all going to be booked with first-degree premeditated murder. You two will go to the juvenile assessment center. You go. You will go to the Marion County Jail. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. Take a deep breath. You'll have no bond. You won't be getting out. How many years? Oh, I, honey, this is not. <clears throat> listen to me. Everybody, just take a deep breath. Like, no. well, since we really did do anything. No, no, no. See, but you did. But you did. Let's, let, first of all, let's get over that hump right now, okay? <laughs> that we really didn't do anything because everybody's complicit here. A person died. A person was murdered. Okay. We all knew about it. We all planned it. We were all involved in getting it done. So let's let's hop that hurdle first, okay? Let's man up to the fact that, damn it, this was a pretty heinous crime and we all had something to do with it. Now we gotta deal with what will happen with, to us from that, okay? Yeah, well, it was like the fact, like, I know I was scared because I'm like, had a gun and oh, I was You know what, scared. stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Do you think we haven't been listening to everything you guys have been saying? <laughs> are, you, are you not stupid, really? I know. And just stop, because I don't, I don't even- Dude, this is awesome! Are you really that stupid? She says, dude, let her cook. Well, it was like the fact, like, I know I was scared because I'm like, had a gun and oh, I was you know what? Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Do you think we haven't been listening to everything you guys have been saying in here? Are you, are you that stupid, really? I know. And just stop because I, I don't even, lying to me just makes me just, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, you lied about a few things. But anyway, that's what's going to happen. Um, it is one step at a time. Remember to breathe. That's how we get through stuff like this, okay? But you know what? I will say, you, sir, I have a lot of admiration for because at least you told the truth. Having praised Kyle for his honesty, she informs them that they will be booked, but that they still have the trial to determine their guilt or innocence. What? How? Is Roach going and to I do mean, this? Yes, he has to. He's admitted his part. He will be booked also. She tells Kyle and Amber they will let her see her mother before they have to leave and then departs. The staggering reality of their situation begins to sink in. <laughs> we're, all, we're all in for murder. <laughs> I'm like, what? Did you say, why did you lie? I said, this is our life now. Oh my God, man. <laughs> we, we didn't do anything with the body or anything like that. Five years ago. <laughs> Amber is unable to grasp the true magnitude of what a first-degree murder conviction would mean. Five years would be a drop in the bucket compared to what she can expect. And I'm gone, Joe. Joe's gonna be fine. He's not gonna stay. Oh, no, no. no. Please. Someone record this their reaction when they find play, out, please. Play this all. Five years! <laughs> Did I 
be 20 when you get out. I'm my ass beat in there. despair the detectives let Justin into the room he is not happy Detectives now had a pretty good idea of what oh, may have did. happened to Seth, but there Life were still is over. missing pieces to the puzzle and a suspect at large. However, everything was about to fall into place. Later that same night in Stark, Florida, James Williams Sr. was driving home. He'd only stopped at work long enough to tell his boss that he needed the night off because there was something very important that he had to do. That something was taking Mike Bargo to turn himself in to the police. Mike was his daughter's boyfriend, so Mr. Williams had offered him sanctuary in good faith, unaware of the real reason Mike needed a place to lie low. Yet just before, for his overnight shift, Mike admitted the truth to him, or at least a version of it, and agreed to turn himself in. Now cleared of his work obligations, Mr. Williams was on his way to help him do just that. However, as he neared his house, he witnessed a multitude of flashing blue lights surrounding it. It seems the police had already tracked Mike and were going to relieve him of his duty. This is James Williams Sr. He is the father of Mike Bargo's girlfriend, Kristen, and is the man he chose to stay with while on the run from police. Tell me how you became involved in this and what, what knowledge do you have? About okay. This? I just run down everything exactly to the you as what happened. Okay. Yesterday, I got a call um, from him, actually from my daughter, wanting to know if he could come up and stay at my house for a couple of days. At which point she didn't tell me anything more than that. And then he called shortly thereafter. And I said, well, he said, he said, look, I got in an altercation in Ocala. The place I was living, got into a fight, and I just, they threw me out of the house and I needed a place to stay for a few days while things cooled down. And he said, you know, and he started getting all emotional. I'm like, I figured it was something. You know, I said, what's going on, Mike? And he says, he said, Jimmy, he said, at that point, I believe he said yesterday or the day before, I believe he said the day before, um, that somebody had raped his little sister and he shot him eight times and killed him. Mike eight. seems to feel the need to get things off his chest, but still can bring himself to be completely honest. And I started talking to him and I said, look, man, I said, I'm telling you right now, I don't need no trouble like this. And I said, you don't either. <coughs> The best thing for you to do is turn yourself in. And he pretty much agreed that that's what he was going to do. He said he was going to call his father to come get him. <clears throat> Mr. Williams claimed he had a strict job, so he had to go check in before he could request time off. He went to do so, intending to come back and be the one to take Mike to the station, even though he didn't tell him. While he's gone, Mike decides to open up to someone else in the household. This is Crystal Anderson, Mr. Williams' live-in girlfriend. She was at the house during Mike's visit. And then after I got done cooking, and I got Tim up to go to work, and he left, and Mike's like, can I talk to you? And he said that the little girl that lives there, that's 15 years old, said that her boyfriend had raped her. And I was like, oh my God, are you for real? And he's like, yeah, and he's like, I killed him. I said, what? Mike completely unburdens himself, telling the entire story to Crystal as she listens in horror. According to Crystal, Mike claimed that he killed Seth because Seth had allegedly assaulted Amber. Because James and Crystal are important figures in his girlfriend's life, he may have wanted to make himself look better in their eyes. If he said he only killed to protect a girl he saw as his little sister, he may have believed he would appear more sympathetic to them. And he said that after he did that, that he took five gallon buckets and put the ashes in the buckets 
him and the cross that had, had drove him to some place where he, they go swimming out. And had took center blocks and tied them to the bucket. Oh. And threw his body in the river. Crystal's story cements James Haven's culpability as she describes that he was involved in disposing of the body. Several accounts place Justin Soto at the scene, too. Allegedly, Amber texted James Havens, her stepfather, and asked him to come to Charlie's house. Once there, James helped Mike and Justin I know. load Do the paint cans, cinder blocks, and a dog leash into the back of his truck, and Mike gave him directions to the quarry. I cannot there, believe it's three, almost 3.30 already. And threw them into the quarry. And he called his dad. And he told him that Justin Soto was there. And they were looking for him, and I told him, I said, Mike, I said, you got to tell Jim what's going on. You got, you got to tell him. I said, I can't let him get in no trouble because you want to be crazy. And I, I had called my cousin that was across the road, but nobody was home because I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Okay. And is that when we showed up? Yeah. Now that these interviews have concluded, there is, of course, one more person who the police need to have a little chat with. Which one? This one or that one? This is 18-year-old Mike Bargo, mastermind and instigator of the Seth Jackson murder. He flops down in the chair where the detective directs him, his body language immediately seeming to indicate that he will not be as cooperative as his fellow conspirators. Do I crazy off the way? They're really killing my wrist. Mike may be feeling powerless, so he tries to take control of the situation right away by asking to have the handcuffs removed. The detective complies likely to build goodwill. I got a hold in that hand, and as you can tell. Okay. I'm a detective from the American Sheriff's Office. Okay? I think you know why I'm here to talk to you. Okay? Before we talk or anything, I have to advise you of your rights. You understand that? Mm-hmm. Okay. You understand each of these rights I have explained to you? Yes, sir. Have these rights in mind. Do you wish to talk to you? It says us here, but I'm saying me. You wish to talk to me now? Um, I'd like to be the one phone call, because I... I need to get a hold of somebody. I need to call my lawyer. You want to talk to a lawyer? Is that what you're telling me? I mean, I'll talk to you, but I don't want to do that. Hold on, hold on a second. You just said you want to talk to a lawyer. Did you want I talk to a lawyer or do you want to talk to me? I want to clarify that first. You talk to a lawyer. Okay. The detective cuffs him again and leads him away. Before questioning has even begun, it is over. The so-called Summerfield Six, Mike Bargo, Amber Wright, Kyle Hooper, Charlie Ely, Justin Soto, and James Havens III were charged for their roles in Seth Jackson's murder and faced trial. James Havens III was charged as an accessory to murder after the fact for helping dispose of the body and pleaded guilty. His sentence carries a penalty of up to 30 years in prison, Holy. but the most recent updates indicate that his sentence was deferred. Amber, Kyle, Charlie, and Justin were convicted of first-degree murder, receiving life sentences. In 2020, after serving nearly 10 wow. years of prison time, Charlie Ely's lawyer earned a retrial on claims of an ineffective defense team, and she accepted a plea deal for second-degree murder, reducing her sentence by a decade. With time served, wow. she was freed at 27 years old. As both the primary instigator and shooter, Mike Bargo was sentenced to death for his crime what? and awaits his fate on death row. His last words before heading back to his cell after sentencing were reportedly, May God have mercy on my soul. What? Wait, how old was he? I am shocked they sentenced him to death. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, wow. Crazy. 18? Oh.